do you think uh, you see the case where you know people the entrepreneur comes in saying yes i need the you know the investor to be well engaged and actually they're not prepared for that level of engagement so basically they want the money but uh, <laughs> So engagement just from the point of view of just taking the money or after they get the money? After they get the money. Yeah. So most entrepreneurs are incredibly smart and therefore they just need the money. That's what they think. <laughs> if the going is good, then they say, ah, see, I told you so. If the going is not good, that's when they start looking for the entrepreneur. And depending on what stage of if they are really nearly dying and they die, they're saying that the entrepreneur says that the investor was no good. Well, you never came to the investor in time and told us what the problem was or didn't engage and communicate. And then there are situations where the investor is willing to help and does find out that there is a problem. And if collectively both of them come out together, then they're champions, right? So then each of them will talk very good things about each other. So this is all a question of communication and the interpersonal skill that do you really believe that this investor has a strategic, again, part of it is that these folks that we've chosen here are obviously not typical. These folks are choosing investors, which is phenomenal in India, right? Today's day and age, uh, it's very rare, right? Entrepreneurs are running around here and there because the number of entrepreneurs have risen so dramatically that they're all just running around, especially in the social space, that they're all running around and just trying to figure out, you know, where to get the money. So you'll be, in a very small percentage of the people who do get funded, most people don't get funded, right? So many, many people would just be happy that they get funded. From the and investor point of view, it's again the same thing. We're looking for the unicorn. We're looking for the biggest and the best, and whether it's from the impact point or financial returns or some or the combination of both, hopefully. And we are really, really hoping that here is a fantastic. So my investment thesis, for example, is who, what, and how, right? Most people know that, and who is. Who is this people? What's the background? The founders, you know, they're really the gumption. If they need to pivot, are they the right people? Will they listen uh, or will they be too hard-headed? So some people are only yes sir man and, or woman and then there are some who are completely drastically sort of very strong, stubborn. Uh, so who? Then what is what is this 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 uh, idea? Is it a global idea? Is it, is it going to scale? Is it practical? Is it pragmatic? Then once you go past that, then you talk about how. How is, how is, what is the execution? Are they able to execute? Will they be able to execute? And, and stuff like that. So I think we are looking for entrepreneurs who have fantastic ideas who are able to execute all the time. So I think your question was that saying, hey, what can you do to prepare so that you become fundable, investable? And that's it. I think it's, it's fairly simple from where I see it. I think one of the things that we can bring out of a session like this, we're going to set up a <coughs> Slack channel. When we, so if you drop your business cards, we are going to try to do that thing, which happens at some conferences where apparently you're going to set up a Yahoo group, but it never happens. But we're going to do this. We're going to set up a Slack channel to try to figure out if, at the very least, what we can do is uh, essentially landscape. Uh, the, uh, the most of the investors know one another, and there's enough co-investing and syndication and the beginnings of collaboration that we can actually get a sense of you know, from you know the earliest stage in the seed, from the angels all the way through, uh, we can actually try to start to map this out to make it a little bit easier, because it's happened so many times where you end up uh, being co-investors in a business, and then you know something happens, and the proverbial you know something hits the fan, and then you're all looking at each other, and in more than one instance, uh, you know you, suddenly you realize the investor sitting next to you doesn't necessarily share the same view, the same value. Maybe there's a shark fit under their jacket you can't see. And then that comes out, and then the, 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 the tensions aren't just, you know, across the table. It's on the same side of the table as well. So I think that, you know, a bit more information and landscaping, maybe even feedback loops uh, from the experiences of entrepreneurs in the post-investment phases might be useful. I think when we started, we probably, there were very little accelerators out there and then suddenly there was this like period where there were like hundreds of accelerators out there and you were like, where do these come from? And, um, but they weren't necessarily as relevant. Like if I think about today, it's taking me, I'm in my fifth year of my journey and I'm hoping it's eight years of my journey. And, and I always ask myself this question of, had I known what I known back then now, um, would I, and I'd be starting something, exactly the same thing I'm doing like right now. Had I been doing it now, 
uh, with different energy, different like spirit because I'm not burned out completely, but like would I be able to do what I'm doing faster? And, and so when I'm looking at mentors or accelerators or what I think is missing right now are some of the growth stage or mid-stage like social businesses that have gone through a path of destructing, destruction but survived. And could they be better mentors to kind of help in new age company journeys and then be a part of some of these accelerated programs but then get incentivized for it? Because let's be honest, like I run a company, I'm not going to do this for free, but I see the value in a very significant way. And I think that that would be an important part of what we're looking at as well as we're growing this. And that's also true for the investor side. Because you know, when you have you know senior tenured investors that have been doing this for a number of years and you're looking back and you're going, hmm, like there's a reason for why you've looked at joint due diligence. And there's a reason why a new investor coming in and being like, what are you talking about? But you're talking about your pain points of what you've gone through and why it's been so frustrating. So I think there's a, there's, there's a different way of understanding how we can bring in value of our frustrating experiences and then streamline it, but then communicate more. And one last thing, we very recently um, through Echo and Green did an impact cohort where we brought together 20 impact investors and it was 20 growth stage entrepreneurs that were very clear that we're not you know, trying to get money from you. We just really wanna understand your business model and your problems. And you know, you know ours in and out. We actually realize we don't know yours. We don't know why you don't, why you invest in a foreign country but yet don't have a fund manager here. We don't understand why your due diligence process takes us long. We don't understand what, who your funders are and what challenges you face. And as we started having that dialogue, it, opened, it was very like eye-opening to see that actually you're as much of a business as we are and you know, we all have really interesting experiences. And so we, we, come to, we came to the table of saying, are there ways for us to do our job better? But then is there also ways for us to make you understand why you could do better um, if we started looking at more collaborations? And I think we're starting to see that now in the impact investment space when you're, especially for India. But it's an interesting thing to start opening up that dialogue in a very, in a different way. Uh, just coming back to three or four comments uh, relating to the who, um, you know, who, how, what, uh, the question of, of completing due diligence and checking off all the boxes so that your fund funders of the, you know, after you're placing the money, um, don't, and you have a, have a problem that you say, well, I did all the due diligence, so I checked it all off. Um, the, I think it's very sophisticated of you to say how, because that's something that's hard to quantify. How are they going to work with their team? How are they going to work with us to solve problems? Because the problems are going to come. That's a really critical thing. But I want to come back to one of the reasons I put up due diligence, and that is that uh, if I think we could examine failures and see what kind of patterns there are to could we have found out about that reason for the failure if we had done due diligence. And if we look at the patterns there, we might actually eliminate a lot of due diligence that actually doesn't lead to failures. And I don't know if that's if that collaboration of people, sh investors sharing their failures and engaging the entrepreneur who had failed in the discussion will potentially lead us to a more um, you know, focused type of uh, due diligence. I think it's happening in any market where people are talking enough about their failures to help this process. I think it's got to be pretty rigorously done though. How many of you are uh, looking for investment now? Take the damn money. Okay, don't listen to any of these guys. Money is not easy to come by. Take the damn money. You know, I think, I think one of the missing pieces I've realized is what I think is empathy. In the sense, I think the problem with the entrepreneur is he thinks the investor has a lot of money, so what's the big deal about signing a check? I'm spending five years of my life with all my cool technology developing this clever product, and all this guy is doing is, you know, just handing me a check. And I always think if as a founder, you think, suppose you were the guy signing the check, how careful would you be about not only what you asked for, but how you would value that money? I think a lot of the respect, which is often missing in some of these conversations, after the money has changed hands, perhaps will come back. And like you said, you know, sometimes you find out even investors, co-investors don't agree. Very honestly, often co-founders at the end of a year or two years don't agree anymore. And then, you know, one person wants to exit, the other person wants to start a new company. So I think the good thing about all this is life is interesting, exciting. You're right, even if we had this conversation after five years, uh, we will still have some additional stuff to discuss. No question. Yes, one last point to entrepreneurs to remember is you remember you have a management control, you have a board control, you have a shareholding control. 
So with affirmative rights. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, just right. remember that and then get into any conversation. Yeah. Just wanting to share another thing. So when so we so there is a difference in sales. So impact investors come in when people need seed investment. Like we when uh, Rema and Innovent and Beyond Capital came into our company, we were just a very small organization, tiny organization. And, and and when I when they asked me to sign a 70 page uh, uh, shareholder agreement, I was like, oh God, I didn't understand most of it. Now uh, we have covered. Now it's 2016. We are trying to roll out a franchisee. The agreement is 120 pages long. <laughs> so they they since them being investors and those companies being very early stage, we are not talking about venture capital into series B or series C in impact investment. Obviously, uh, there is a mismatch between what the entrepreneur understands, but the investor being already an investor and experience, they, 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 they can visualize what the problems might be there as, as such. Rito. I think the, the, the last few points have been excellent. All the points I think that we've covered have been excellent. What's interesting <coughs> is that whether it comes to due diligence, too bad we didn't have time to get into valuation, because that's, <laughs> that's a whole other thing. Um, um, there are multiples on EBITDA, on the valuation, you know, and they're not in the double digits in the beginning. <laughs> um, no, the, uh, uh, at least when it comes to time frames around due diligence, time frames around the structuring, the legal agreements, um, and uh, the willingness to think about the capital chain, the willingness to reach out there. It, uh, what's really great, I think, is that um, we, we do have the means by which to uh, improve uh, as a collective amongst investors and also together with the entrepreneurs. Uh, that's one of the reason we, these sessions happen or, um, are, are sort of surround, you know, they're based on the premise that we are going to make improvements, we are going to achieve efficiencies, even if it takes 10 years, that's okay, we're still, we're still working towards it. The state of attention is great. If you would like to bring forward a particular idea, a particular thought, uh, something that we could test uh, through the context, in the con from the Arthur perspective, we run the Arthur Venture Challenge, maybe there's something that we can try out, something new, we're open. So that's one of the things that we'd like you to bear in mind moving forward as we uh, set up our Slack channel. Please drop off your business card so that we can include you or anybody else that you think should be part of the conversation. Maybe we can carry this forward. And thank you. This is, I think, I, I hope you agree that it was uh, a different kind of session and uh, an enlightening okay. all the same. Thanks. Thanks.